Amen. Now, I was going to put you guys up here. There we go. Okay, 15. And now, let me remind you, since it seems to have escaped you, brethren, of the gospel, the glad tidings of salvation, which I proclaim to you, which you welcomed and accepted, and upon which your faith rests, and by which you are saved, if you hold fast and keep firmly what I preach to you, unless you believed at first without effect, and all for nothing. For I passed on to you, first of all, what I also received, that Christ the Messiah, the Anointed One, died for our sins, in accordance with what the scriptures foretold, that he was buried, he rose on the third day, as scriptures foretold, and that he appeared to Caiaphas, Peter, then to the twelve. Caiaphas was Peter. Then later he showed himself to more than 500 brethren at one time, the majority of whom are still alive, but some have fallen asleep in death. Afterward, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, the special messengers, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one prematurely and born dead, no better than an unperfected fetus among living men. For I am the least worthy of the apostles, who am not fit or deserving to be called an apostle because I once wronged and pursued and molested the church of God, oppressing it with cruelty and violence. But by the grace, unmerited favor and blessing of God, I am what I am and his grace toward me was not found to be for nothing, fruitless and without effect. In fact, I worked harder than all of them, the apostles, through it, Though it was not really I, but the grace, the unmerited favor and blessing of God, which was with me. So whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed, what you adhered to and trusted in and relied on. But now in Christ, the Messiah is preached as raised from the dead. Now it is that some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead, but... If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain. It mounts to nothing, and your faith is devoid of truth and is fruitless, without effect, empty, imagery, and unfounded. We are even discovered to be misrepresenting God, for we testified of him that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise in case. It is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is more delusion, fruit, fruitless, and you are still in your sins under the control and penalty of sin. And further, those who have died in spiritual fellowship and union with Christ have perished, are lost. If we who are abiding in Christ have hope only in this life, and that is all, then we are all of people most miserable and to be pitied. But the fact is that Christ the Messiah has been raised from the dead and he became the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep in death. For since it was through a man that death came into the world, it is, it is also through a man that the resurrection of the dead has come. For just as because of their union in nature in Adam all people die, so also by virtue of their union of nature shall all in Christ be made alive. But each in his own rank and turn, Christ the Messiah is the first fruits. Then those who are in Christ's own will be resurrected at his coming. After that comes the end, the completion, when he delivers over the kingdom of God the Father after rendering inoperative and abolishing every other rule and every authority and power. For Christ must be king and reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be subdued and abolished is death. For he, the Father, has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection under him, it is evident that he himself is accepted who does the subjecting of all things to him. However, when everything is subjected to him, then the Son himself will also subject himself to the Father, who put all things under him, so that God may be in all the everything 
to be everything to everyone supreme, the indwelling and controlling factor of life. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized in behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? For that matter, why do I live dangerously as I do, running such risks that I am in peril every hour? I assure you by the pride which I have in you, in your fellowship and union with Christ Jesus our Lord, that I die daily, I face death every day and die to self. What do I gain if merely from the human point of view? I fought with beasts at Ephesus. If the dead are not raised at all, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we will be dead. Do not be deceived and misled. Evil companionship corrupts and depraves good manners and morals and character. Awake from your drunken stupor. Return to sober sense and your right mind and sin no more. For some of you have not the knowledge of God. You are utterly and willfully and disgracefully ignorant and continue to be so lacking the sense of God's presence and all true knowledge of him. I say this to your shame. But someone will say, how can the dead be raised? With what kind of body will they come forth? You foolish man, every time you plant seed, you sow something that does not come to life, germinating, springing up and growing, unless it dies first. Nor is the seed you sow than the body which is going to have, but it is a naked kernel, perhaps, of wheat or some of the rest of the grains. But God gives it to the body that he plans and fit sees it sees fit and to each kind of seed a body of its own for all flesh is not the same but there is one kind for humans another for beasts another for birds another for fish there are heavenly bodies sun moon and stars there are earthly bodies men animals and plants but the beauty and glory of the heavenly bodies is of one kind while the beauty and glory of earthly bodies is a different kind. The sun is glorious in one way, the moon is glorious in another way, and the stars are glorious in their own way. For one star differs from, a, from and surpasses another in its beauty and brilliance. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable and decays. But the body that is resurrected is imperishable, immune to decay, immortal. It is sown in dishonor and humiliation. It is raised in honor and glory. It is sown in infirmity and weakness. It is resurrected in strength and endowed with power. It is sown in natural physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. As surely as there are physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, became a living spiritual life. But it is not the spiritual life which came first, but the physical and then the spiritual. The first man was out of earth, made of death, dust. The second man is the Lord from out of heaven, Jesus. Now those who are made of the dust are like him who was first made of the dust earthly minded and as is the man from heaven so also are those who are of heaven heavenly minded and just as we have borne the image of the man of dust so shall we and so let us also bear the image of the man of heaven but i tell you this brethren flesh and blood cannot become partakers of eternal salvation and inherit or share in the kingdom of god nor does the perishable that which is decaying, inherit or share in the imperishable, the immortal. Take notice, I tell you, a mystery, a secret truth, an event decreed by the hidden purpose of the counsel of God. We shall not all fall asleep in death, but we shall be changed, transformed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet call, for a trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, free and immune from decay, and we shall be changed, transformed. For this perishable part of us must put on the imperishable nature. This mortal part of us, this nature that is capable of dying, must put on immorality, immortality, not immorality, immortality, freedom from death. 
And when this perishable puts on the imperishable, and this that was capable of dying puts on freedom from death, then shall the fulfilled scripture that says, death is swallowed up in unto victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Now sin is the sting of death, and sin exercises its power upon the soul through the abuse of the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory, making us conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be firm, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, always being superior, excelling, doing more than enough, in the service of the Lord, knowing and being continually aware that your labor in the Lord is not futile. It is never wasted or to no purpose. Praise God. It's exciting. Everything in the Lord, in the Lord is from him. Everything we do, we live and move and have our being in him. Praise God. Chapter 16. Now concerning the money contributed for the relief of the saints, God's people, you are to do the same as I directed the churches of Galatia to do. On the first day of each week, let each one of you put aside something and save it up as he has purposed in proportion to what he has given, so that no collections will need to be taken after I come. And when I arrive, I will send on those whom you approve and authorize with credentials to carry your gift to Jerusalem. For it seems worthwhile that I should go to, they will, they will accompany me. After passing through Macedonia, I will visit you, for I intend to pass through Macedonia. But it may be that I will stay with you for a while, perhaps even spend the winter, so that you may bring me forward to wherever I may go, for I am willing, unwilling to see you right now, just in passing, but I hope later to remain for some time with you, if the Lord permits. I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door of opportunity for effectual service has opened to me there, a great and promising one, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy arrives, see to it that you put him to ease so that he may be fearless among you, for he is devoted, doing the Lord's work just as I am. So see to it that no one despises him or treats him as if he were of no account or slights him, but send him off cordially, speed him on his way in peace, that he may come to me, for I'm expecting him to come along with the other brethren." As for our brother Apollos, I have urgently encouraged him to visit you with the other brethren, but it was not at all his will or God's will that he should go now. He will come when he has opportunity. Be alert and on your guard. Stand firm in your faith, your conviction, respecting man's relationship to God and divine things, keeping the trust and holy fervor born of, of faith and a part of it. Act like men and be courageous. Grow in strength. Let everything you do be done in love, true love to God and man as inspired by God's love for us. Now, brethren, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts and our first fruits in Achaia, most of Greece, and how they have consecrated and devoted themselves to the service of the saints, God's people. I urge you to pay all difference in such leaders to enlist under them and be subject to them as well as to everyone who joins and cooperates and labors earnestly. I'm happy because Stephanus and Fortunus and Achaeus have come to me for they have made up for your absence. For they give me respite from labor and re rested me and refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Deeply appreciate and thoroughly know and fully recognize such men. The churches of Asia send greetings and best wishes. Aquila and Priscilla, together with the church in their house, send you their hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brethren wish to be remembered to you and wish you well. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, greetings with all my hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, does not have a friendly affection for him, is not kin kindly disposed toward him, he shall be accursed. Our Lord will come. Maranatha. The grace, favor, and spiritual blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. 
my love, that true love growing out of sincere devotion to God be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. So this was a letter from um, Paul as he was writing from, um, sh 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 sh. he was writing from, I believe he was writing from prison and he was talking about how Timothy is going to be on his way to visit me. Um, he was talking about loving one another, helping one another, encouraging one another, and, and just living life together in the unity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, being encouraged with one another and, and just edifying one another. And this is our life in him. This is the kingdom life. It's the good old life. And we are someday going to be together in heaven. It says to encourage each other with these words. When, when you see the heavens open and, God, and Jesus coming down in the clouds of glory, we're going to meet him in the air. And so encourage one another with these words. And I encourage you. We're, we're, that day is coming. We're excited. We're ready. We're ready to go and be together in heaven forever and ever in glory. And But while we're waiting, while we're here, we just praise God that we can be in unity together in the brethren, in love and in peace and in, united in the spirit of God. That's what I mean about unity, united in the spirit of God, in the same God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one. Jesus, the Father, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one, that we're united, that we encourage one another, we look out for each other, that we're here for one another because we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And our whole desire is to win the lost and be encouragement for each other and pray for each other until that day. So be blessed today, and I thank you that you came. And remember, your words are your way to victory. I'll see you tomorrow on Portunate. Thanks for coming.